Before we start, I just want to say this is a very special episode of Philosophy versus Improv with a top flight guest, Babette Babich, philosophy professor. And this came out of when I was preparing for the Partially Examined Life episode 289 on Hume's The Standard of Taste. Babette is the person who edited the collection called Reading David Hume's On the Standard of Taste. And she provides some really illuminating background on the conditions under which the essay was written that makes you just reevaluate the whole thing. So I hope in particular PEL fans will enjoy this one. But it's absolutely fine if you have not listened to that Partially Examined Life episode and have no intention to do so. I think this stands alone as well. Here we go. This is Philosophy versus Improv, where two sages try to teach each other a thing or two, and maybe you, the audience, get something out of it as well. I'm Mark Lindsay Meyer, a philosophy worshiper who's interested in learning improv. And I'm Bill Arnett, an improv contractor ready to dive into philosophy. And we have a special guest today. Babette, please introduce yourself. I am Babette Babich, and I teach philosophy at Fordham, and occasionally I also I'm interested in improv questions as a question. <laughs> Perfect. Wonderful. So yes, you have the distinction, I believe, of being our first philosophy guest who is a professional philosopher who is not somebody that I've had prior contact with, not someone who runs her own podcast, but somebody that was relevant to a Partially Examined Life episode that I had just done that touched on Hume's standard of taste, and you had done a nice secondary reading on that. Just to remind the listeners, Bill comes in with an improv lesson. I usually come in with a philosophy lesson. We've sort of established beforehand that we're going to talk about the thing that you were writing about, which is the role of the judge that would get at whether beauty, whatever we're using our aesthetic faculties is subjective or objective, what sort of expertise this is, questions surrounding that. Do you have any sort of opening statement on that? And then we'll uh, <laughs> use Bill as our Mino, our whoever Socrates is talking to, and do a little teaching of that, and then he'll start us on some improv. I think it's hard to have an opening statement except to say it's Hume's last word. So if you're thinking of David Hume at all, and if you're thinking of a Scotsman, they're always very parsimonious with what they do. And this was a forced text. He didn't mean to write it. If he hadn't been forced to write it, he would never have written it. And I think that that makes a huge difference. And it's really one of the oldest things in art where you're like, what do you know? How can you make a judgment? And the judge in this case was William Warburton, who was, of course, in charge of the Church of Scotland, who basically said, I'm excommunicating you and everybody if you don't change your four essays. And so he's like, OK. And he pulls them. He changes them, moves it to five. And he writes it just for the length. So it's the full length of what you need to make a book. And I think very few people who write on it really pay attention to what's the most obvious thing about it, which is what you just f focused on, the judge. Where does the judge come off with his judgment? And he's not referring to his own essay. He's referring to the original idea with his stuff on immortality and, of course, religion and the other things that were close to his heart as a Scotsman and as a pretty much a skeptic from the get-go. The fact that it was kind of under duress, do you think it changed the content? Like if you had more time to think about it, if it wasn't an act of defense, it would be different? Can we guess how it would have been different? Yeah, sure, because he wrote on it. He wrote on delicacy. He wrote on all the things we like today with smell and taste. He'd already written on that. And that was what the ladies excel at, he said. They were better in terms of, you know, I don't like this wine or I like this dessert, that kind of thing. Because he had written, but... But this particular thing, for the last essay he would write in his life, I don't think he planned it to be on the standard of taste. Bill, one of the things that we've talked about before on this show that had to do with David Hume, although I don't know if I dropped David Hume's name in this, but was the is-ought distinction. Do you remember yeah. how that worked with ethics? Can you recite that back? Do you, do you remember <laughs> what the issue is? Well, it's something that resonated with me and my layman's view, which hopefully anyone can understand, is this idea that just because you see something out in the world and you see how the world works, well, that doesn't mean it's the right way to do things or it's the proper way of doing things. And you can look at, certainly, if you grew up in a time of slavery or grew up in any time, it's easy to look around and say, well, this is how things are. I mean, someone made that decision. I mean, they knew what they're doing. And we kind of presume that the way things are is by design or that it's by choice. And it is not just how we ended up here and that there's any value to what we see, as opposed to there actually might be a better way of doing things and that people 
will lazily say, well, because this is how the way it is, it's how it ought to be and move on with their lives and not actually question how things are. That phenomena <laughs> exemplifies a more general logical point. Babak, can you sort of fill in the details of is to ought? And of course, I'm trying to ultimately move to the ought that is you ought to judge this to be good. So I'm doing the, the ethics thing as a preliminary here. Wow. So you're moving good old David Hume to Kant in that elegant way, because you should just judge as I do, is really Kant's claim on you. You have to make the judgment. But the art for Hume is just a little different when it comes to the claim he's making about the standard of taste. He's not quite up to Kant, for good reason. Kant didn't write yet. Let me <laughs> let's sketch out the view that you're saying is false. But this was something I had heard about Hume, that in the realm of ethics, Hume and Kant, I believe, both thought that you could observe all the natural phenomena that you want. You could say, this action gives this amount of pleasure to this person. You could say, if I do this, this will kill everybody. None of those things by itself is logically enough to ground, well, you shouldn't do that thing that will kill everybody. You should do that thing that will bring pleasure to the most people because there has to be some sort of more primal normative ought claim in there. Like, we have the moral obligation to preserve life. So, you know, some... Very basic things, but something that if you didn't already come equipped with that. So for Hume, this is going to be a sentiment. We just have moral sentiments. We react in certain ways when we see people doing things that then we call bad. And that is enough to ground us. We don't have to have an argument from first principles from, you know, that you could even convince a computer or convince some creature that was in no way like us. It's the fact that we come with these sentiments and that's enough for us to then come up with moral judgments so I was thinking that for aesthetics, it was a similar thing. It's not that, as some past philosophers have claimed, that there are measurable properties in the world like this painting, this human face involves symmetry, right? Symmetry is something you could measure. And therefore, it is beautiful. No, it is just that we come with the sentiments that maybe we find that kind of thing beautiful. But, you know, it's all based on the sentiment that we already have, not on the objective thing in the world. Is that parallel work? I'm going to agree with that because I think that that is right. But Hume throws in this wrench into the works, which is something artists always do. Even, I think, in the case of improv, some things are funny now that didn't used to be funny. Lenny Bruce, very different things in current moment. So things change. We update it. Like the marvelous Mrs. Meisel is updated. It's not really the same as listening to a recording of Lenny Bruce from the day. So Hume is bringing that in and he's saying, there's Homer and there's a judgment and we still say this is great stuff. But there are things that are also temporarily changing. And that, I think, becomes a very important point. Even Kant is going to draw on that. He's going to draw on the Indian sachem, the chief who comes to Paris and he likes the restaurants best. They're the things which stand out to him. They didn't have the Eiffel Tower at the time, but other things of that sort. So it's the time element that brings in change, and it brings in changes in taste in a strange way, changes in what counts as beautiful. Hottentot Venus, for example. Not everybody would be carrying that in their pocket as a way to kind of pass the hours. Talking about like music, would punk music have been as successful as it was if it hadn't been for following on the heels of really overblown prog rock? We were ready for that. We'd grown tired of what has been there. So here's something that's an antidote to it. You know, the impressionist painting after the photorealistic Dutch masters. I get it. We can reproduce. Well, they didn't even have photography, but you know what I'm saying? It's like, here's something that's so realistic. It's not beautiful anymore. I want something different. I want, man, those impressionists, that's really fascinating. And you can't even judge them on the same scale. To Mark's point about how do you objectively compare some photorealistic, I can't think of the artist's name now, who's known for making these incredibly realistic looking pictures to, to a water lily, you know? You can't even really compare them. You can't compare it to the actual impressionist picture of a water lily or to the actual water lily itself. Two paintings. What's that? I wish I could remember this painter's name. He was known for doing these photorealistic paintings right before the impressionists. I think there were more than a, more than one. There were several. There were many of them. There I were mean, many the of them. I mean, lights, which excel in such, you know, gothic, sweet, overly sweet, realist images. In fact, it was even alleged that they used some kind of camera obscura, you know, some kind of photographic or light bending technique in order to achieve these things. But how do you compare one of those paintings to certainly an abstract expressionist? I mean, if we really want to get extreme, how do you even compare them except by taste? So this is getting at what the crux is, is beauty an objective thing in the world or subjective? 
if it was purely objective, like I said, like, oh, symmetry, there's some formula, then any clod who can detect that formula, it might take some discernment to detect the formula. It's instantiation out in the world. But once you detect that, you could say, ah, I know objectively that is good and that is less good. But we think that's not how it works. You actually have to feel the pleasure. Your artistic sense has to tingle. And so Hume is saying that it is subjective in that sense, though there are still going to be standards of taste, thus the title of the essay. And there are going to be some critics who are excellent at detecting. I guess this is one of the questions. Is it just that they have properties, virtues that could be defined without reference to just having good taste? Hume talks about being able to detect if there is a key in a big vat of wine that you could taste a little metal, the kind of thing that you could have very acute senses. You could also just have a lot of experience and understanding with the art form in question. Is the judge only defined by things like that? Or is it just, well, but some judges, they could have all those skills, but they just have better taste than others. That would sort of make it circular to say, taste is whatever the judge says it is, but then the good judge is the one that has the best taste. Such a hard question. (laughs) And it's a hard question because Hume doesn't give us the argument. He quotes Cervantes. And Cervantes is sort of giving a picaresque novel in order to make a joke at the expense of the Parker Point people with wine, the one who go by the numbers, who go by that abstract standard. So it's Sancho Panza's unlettered cousins who are the ones who are drinking this excellent wine that has been judged good and saying, "Mm, yes, you're right, but there's a thing. And the thing is the ability that it's like the princess and the pea, being able to still actually pay attention to your sensation when the world is telling you, this is the great wine. And of course, it is a great wine because it's expensive and everyone agrees. And that's what Hume says. But there's this question of the reveal, which is the beautiful thing when you empty the whole cask. So that means you got everyone has to drink that wine and love that wine and pay for that wine before they realize that these bumpkins are right which is Cervantes' point, that's again a time question. Comes out only later when you see that there really is. And then you're right about the physical world. I mean, that's completely true. Vermeer was the painter. I was, But he's, he's on the cover of David Hume, yes. Yeah. That's right. Oh, there we go. Yes, on your list. Yes. <laughs> I think one thing that was left out, I listened to that podcast, and not to call myself an artist, but as an artist, I think something that was missing from all this discussion is the act of creating art and that it's easy for people on the outside coming to improv. How do you improvise? Give me the rules. Give me a checklist on how to improvise. That's a very common attitude. Perhaps even Mark had that attitude. Perhaps. I don't know. (laughs) I assume that one has to have some innate ability and wanted to test whether I have any of that or not. That's a thing. I think we're going into it. Oh, you're in a play. You got to learn all those lines. And it's like, if you're an actor, learning the lines is not what you're concerned about. That might be news to you. But you show up at the first rehearsal already with your lines memorized. The work is not learning the lines. So I think when people who aren't artists talk about art, they take that final product, whatever it is, in complete isolation. And they just look at this final product and not realize that to achieve that final product, and hopefully a good critic will recognize this, but to achieve that final product, you can see the artwork, the work of arting, the work of creating art. And I think that Where does art stop and propaganda begin? You know, where does a picture become just an illustration? You know, there's these weird lines that I think through any good work of art, regardless of who painted it or where they painted it or what it is of, I would like to think that the work of arting is the same across all those things. And someone painting in a cave 5,000 years ago and someone painting today is still trying to put their understanding of the world, their heart, it is a living process the act of painting or creating. And I would like to think that that living process is true across, is universal across all artists. So does this mean that the judge to focus on the spectators and trying to put art on some sort of quality scale is inappropriate, is sacrilegious, is something because this is a fundamental act of creation, like having a child. What, are we going to line up all the children? And like, oh, this is the best... <laughs> I really, good job for you parents. You got, um, maybe you better put that one back in the oven. Oh, I would like to think that the critic could see through the product and see the artist underneath. Now, an expert in a field may be more easily to see through. They may be able to cut through the noise or whatnot or see cheapness or easiness mm-hmm. to see 
the artist's art underneath. And in that regard, they could hopefully, fingers crossed, look at any piece of art and discern the artwork underneath. Have we said enough here to uncover this further through narrative, through humor, through some attempt at something, at actual creation? You could probably do that, but if you went back to the place that I started with, which was always hard to keep in mind, that you had to write this piece because of a bad judge, someone who made a judgment that this shouldn't be published and the press Ooh. should be shut down. That'd be like someone shutting down the podcast. So if someone were to listen to it and like it, that's just fine. The judge is powerful, though. A judge has power. And so when a judge comes in, and this is why we may like everybody's got talent, but you've really got to like those judges, because if you don't, you're not necessarily going to tolerate their judgments when you don't agree with them. Indeed. And judges are human and humans are fallible. They have an agenda. They got a reason for being there. They may have their own. Well, and you yes. could say the judgment is itself a work of creation. Just like, you know, I said, let's start a scene because that would actually be. But we've been having a spontaneous conversation all along. We've been creating media already. So the line of what counts as an artwork. Eh. That was episode one, Mark. That was episode one. We've already been improvising this entire time. We're just ourselves. All right. Do you have an actual exercise to get us going on? I may have already kind of spilled the beans of what I was going for here, but I felt like I saw it in. Now, Babette, I don't know how comfortable you are. We've had some people who are super comfortable improvising, some people who aren't. All we're going to be doing is pretending to be something else. Someone else. That's it. And this other person may actually be quite close to you and similar to your tastes and wants and needs. You know, it's kind of funny that depending on who I'm teaching or working with, how they will probably, I won't say fail, but how they will probably, I won't say screw up either. Their weaknesses are going to be very, very different depending on what they're coming in to do. And if someone wants to, I want to make this thing as funny as I can make it, or I'm just going to hold on for dear life and hope I don't fall off. Their mistakes, quote unquote, will be different. And I think that's kind of interesting that they're based on how they're approaching this. But that's it. We'll keep it really similar and close to the life you already lead as a lecturer and professor. And I think that'll be good. Mark, does that sound good? That sounds great. <laughs> I'm, I'm for some reason more nervous with you, Babette, just because I don't know you in advance. People can't see, but she has set up a background that says reading Hume's The Standard Taste with the picture. Like it's all very professional. And to say, yes. we invited you on to share your wisdom. And now we're going to do a goofy skit for five minutes. Uh, <laughs> you said yes. So let's go ahead. <laughs> and again, not to let my cat out of the bag here, but I hope we will all notice that this thing is alive. It is alive. It is its own thing. And I hope that will happen. So if you're prepared, I'll lay out a very simple scenario. and We can just pretend to be in it. And if something illustrative about what we've been saying about Hume comes out of it, so much the better. Okay, uh, professors, thanks for meeting me here in my office. I know we're going over our syllabuses and lessons plans for next year. Uh, just, you know, I don't know. Enrollment's been kind of down. And I think if we were to get some more pop culture stuff into the syllabus, do some more reading of some more pop culture kind of, I bet, we, I bet the kids would really love to join the program. So one of these kind of Simpsons in philosophy kind of... Doctor Who in philosophy kind of... Well, I mean, that's old. I'm talking like K-pop in philosophy. You know, let's let's get r right on the cutting edge here. What do we say? What do we say? What do you think of Dr. Babich? Uh, do you think this is at all appropriate for children to be indoctrinated? I mean, they're already getting this crap from their everyday lives. Why would we want to give them more of that in the classroom? That's what Alexander Nehamas would say. How can you bring in the New York Times? And you already are. He would say the Greeks were always concerned with popular things. He would say... And at the same time, you'll always lose, So, is what I would add. If you want to be popular at the cutting edge for the kids, they'll always be several steps ahead of you. What are you going to do? You mentioned a name earlier, Alexander... Nehamas. He's a professor of philosophy at Princeton, a okay. friend of mine. I believe uh, so, the kids oh, are really okay. talking a lot about Alexander Nehamas. What about are Alexander they? Nehamas and philosophy? That would be a pop culture well, topic. <laughs> I could get on board with that. I was thinking more like, you know, like Dave Chappelle. Okay. Well, you know, just, you know, maybe, maybe if you just dug through his work a little bit, give it a chance. There might be some pearls in there. Like J.K. Rowling? I thought that was old. Cancel culture. Well, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yes. I mean, th that first book was too long ago. I'm too talking about ago. something really on the cut. If we're going to show we... students that Dave Chappelle is just producing garbage, I'm, I'm all for that. Let's use our classroom to show the, the children the proper taste that really anything that's on their TV just should be wiped out. They should just throw that thing right in the in the garbage. Well, that's an idea. Well, do Dr. Babbage, you mentioned that if we're always chasing popularity, we'll always be a step behind. I think so, because your students are faster than you think. That sounds like a challenge. 
a challenge you will lose. That we can, well, with that attitude, with that attitude, we will lose. All right. So I'm going to maybe just write a syllabus that day. I will just look up. <laughs> I will do a little, like pull up Google Yahoo homepage, Yahoo news and whoever they're talking about on there. Then we'll just lecture on that for the day. Cause that'll be the thing. Is that, is that what you're saying? Perfect. I think that will go very, very, very badly wrong. I don't mean this to say that your entire life's careers up to this point have been a waste of time. I'm not trying to say that. All right. I'm just trying to say that kids today whose tuition fees do ultimately help the university keep it solvent. You know, they, they want someone talking to them. You know, they can we do like the philosophy of unboxing videos? H- how about that? Are you familiar with these what, unboxing what, videos? What, what is that? It's where a child has a toy. And they have a camera on them as they take it out of the box. And they just, well, okay, this is a, a Lego set. And I'm going to open up the box. Okay, all right, there's, there's the instructions. And they're, there's, they're just walking through the process of taking it out of the box. Kids love it, right? They're popular and it's a thing. And I think if y'all tried, we could find some philosophical lessons inside there. Uh, that, that is the dumbest thing I've ever heard. Is that, is that the lesson that we're supposed to get out of this? That children are occupied with things that are literally draining their lives, taking their precious moments on earth and flushing them down a toilet. Is that the lesson we want to, uh, what? Sounds like a judgment. And who's the judge of wasting time? You know, only someone who has wasted a lot of time. How about this? Can we go through the Taco Bell menu and come up with philosophy lessons based on the zesty fiesta? Crunch taco. So, uh, Dr. Babish, am I, am I right that the theory of, You're of, of You're doctor, judgments you, ba- is that someone has to have experienced? I feel like I should be able to dismiss all this stuff categorically, but I understand that only someone who has sort of lived the life of the philosopher and the life of the swine can judge between them. Is that correct? So that maybe we, you know, do research. I will happily delegate this to you to take a semester to uh, spend more time at Taco Bell or whatever the life of the swine involves, and then you can come back and I will shut your judgment as to whether our administrators' or recommendation is a good one. Not sure how that works, but I still think the students will be ahead of you. And I think the lower part of you, the belly part of you, as Plato would say, is ahead of you because you've been to Taco Bell. So it can be done. How did you know that? Okay. How did you? Have you been, have you been to Taco Bell, Professor? Babish? I've been to Taco Bell. I'm very fond of them. Pintos and cheese with extra cheese. Great thing. Uh, now we're say, talking. <laughs> see, okay. See. This is- I thought I'd kept my Taco Bell visits very much under wraps. I, I'm very disturbed <laughs> that this information is public knowledge. I put on a whoa, disguise. Whoa, whoa. I Never mind. Never mind. You kept this knowledge under what, Mark? Wraps. Wraps. Fiesta Crunch Wrap, which I hear if, okay, how about this? If Taco Bell was willing to let y'all eat there, with menu items that have not yet been released. You know, they say that there's a new Mountain Dew Baja Extreme to be paired with a soda pairing with a new Mas Gordita. If we could get those menu items to you before they're released to the public. We would be ahead of the kids. Th- then those little bastards. The and they're, then we'd they're, be ahead of the they're kids. getting on the internet and, and knowing how to work the modem and hooking up to the things that I don't know how to do. I would have a edge on them for once. All right. I would do that for a semester. Just being the old curmudgeon here, I would say that you're already ahead of them if you just go back to the beginning. And they need that anyway. What if I were to say the university is willing to pick up the tab for eating at Taco Bell? We will send a stipend of $37, which should be good for a month of Taco Bell. Does that sweeten the pot? Is this a merger of the university? And I I know that businesses have been buying into that's in the works i don't we i officially cannot speak about that all right well if that's what we got to do to keep our jobs i now work for the time we'll stop right there we'll stop right there very good hey i hope you've been enjoying this special pvi insertion into the pel universe i have bill here with me yes and i hope insertions are always enjoyed uh (laughs) and that got gross i apologize but I wanted to take this opportunity to, as if we were some kind of telethon, but a greedy telethon, not like we're going to help Jerry's kids. Oh, yeah. We wanted to help our season two. So we have been recording for a year now, right? Yeah. How crazy is that? How fun is that? And we were doing every week for a while on PVI here. And then we have switched to every two weeks. 
but the ads have rather dried up. So we're in a little bit of a quandary <laughs> of like how to keep, it doesn't cost a lot to make the show, but it costs a little bit. And so what I would like, we have this Patreon, patreon.com slash philosophy improv. Mm-hmm. And we have a few people signed up for it. I would like to encourage you folks, if you want to hear a season two, I don't want to be like Oral Roberts. Like, you know, if we don't get enough money, they're going to call us home. Yeah. God's going to kill me. But I'm not sure, I can't guarantee at this moment that season two will happen. I would love it to happen. We have some great guests coming up. We're talking to Barry Lamb from Hi-Fi Nation in a minute here. And I'm sure we're going to have wonderful folks from the improv and entertainment worlds as well, right? Oh, yes. Oh, yes. Names that if you read IMDb, you'll see that they had something to do with some of your favorite shows. No spoilers, but I think you'll be happy to see all the fantastic people we got lined up. Yes. And so we would do even more of this, maybe have some... A guest from both sides, maybe a pair of philosophers, maybe a pair of entertainment people do that again. Maybe some people that are just general actors or scholars in some other area. But for that to happen, if you're enjoying this show, you want to hear more of it, you want to hear these used as a follow up to PL like this one was, or it's just it's a playground. We get to do anything. Then yes, go to patreon.com slash philosophy improv and sign up to support the show. And the more supporters we get, I can, I can guarantee if we get a hundred people, even just at a dollar per episode, and you can even cap it off for the month. So it's like a dollar a month. It will for sure happen if we can get that many people. And what I like about modern media is that the consumer has far more control over the content and you can reach us and you can say a little more X, a little less Y, just the right amount of Z and we can meet those requests. Right. We're at your service. We are your servants <laughs> to a point. <laughs> well, yeah, I mean, <laughs> it doesn't hurt to ask. Let me put it that allow way. us our dignity, please. All right, let's get back to the show. All right. How uncomfortable was that, Babette? I seriously enjoyed seeing the two of you interact. I thought that was just a delight. And the video, which is missing from the podcast, just augments so much. If I had been able to see some of your expressions, uh, especially, you know, the extraordinary discussion of Ivan the Terrible and the kind of accidental way we harm those and the complexities, all of that expressed in one event that probably wasn't ever really real. So the artist, when the artist makes something, really creates it out of nothing. There's no photo at all. There's no image at all. There's no record. There's no actual evidence that anything of the actual kind happened, certainly not as we see it. But seeing it that way has a higher truth. Yes, (laughs) that was great. I've been thinking a lot about, and again, listening to some of these things and what is and isn't art. And the line that's easiest to draw is what's the motivation to create this thing? Just as the judge can have a motivation, does the artist have a motivation? And can that motivation be insincere? Can it be my college dean? Clearly their motivation was kind of financial and was certainly willing to throw honest intellectual debate under the bus in order to get funding. Is that considered in any of Hume's works or writings or or is that just, well, the art is done and now? It's huge because, I mean, Andrew Millar, who was his friend and who published his work, would have gone out of business had he not conceded to the judge, censored himself, repressed his books entirely. And the publication history that it would take to bring those essays to light was so long because once Hume cuts the book, changes it and then gives the judge what he wants which is, of course, the church. It's almost a reprise of what Descartes doing, only for real in David Hume's case. So that's why I, I like to think, let's hear between the lines a little bit, because there's an awful lot of sarcasm in David Hume's on the judgment in this particular case of the judge. So what's really happening? And how long do you have to wait before you'll finally know? And philosophers, it was Kant who said that you needed 100 years to be able to have the judge's be in, as it were, be able to judge, capable of judging, looking. And that number seems to get repeated constantly by other philosophers. Maybe it's true. It's a round number. You can't refute it. As much as we rip on the judges, it is very motivating for an artist to continually to create work if there's some sort of structure in which that is being slotted, right? If I, as a musician, have no fans, nobody cares whether I record anymore or not, Well, I might record if I really feel like it, but as has actually happened in my life, it sort of slopes off. Whereas if you have a record deal or whatever and they want another record from you, then you produce another record and you put your whole self in it and you make it as good as you can. But those structures inevitably involve judges. They don't want just another record. They want a record of a certain type that will be saleable in the way that the past records have been or something like that. 
it means you're not yelling out into an open void to have some sort of judge there. So it seems like it has a positive, of course, potentially wholly negative, wholly uh, I hate everything you do <laughs> sort of effect. You've just summarized Nietzsche's life, not David Hume, but Nietzsche, because Nietzsche himself really had not enough readers. That's technically not completely true or we wouldn't have anything, but he didn't have enough to live on. And if you want to make your living on the basis of a podcast, for example, or if you want to make your living on the basis of your professor's job, and professors do that by adjusting down their standard of living compared to the people they went to grad school with or undergrad, especially undergrad because they're all lawyers. So it's a whole problem, but you manage. Nietzsche couldn't do it and not having readers killed him to, in an extraordinary way because there was no echo. So he writes about that. So I think that's so crucial. And if we wanted to stay on aesthetics, that is Hans Georg Gadamer, who was my own teacher, who has a very complicated essay on art, The Relevance of the Beautiful. And if you read it in German, that's the Aktualität, which means, are you connecting? Are you getting the person? Are they hearing you? Are they responding to you? And if you get that, which is the question about the judge, the judge has to actually be right. That Motown artist who's going to do you Maybe he's wrong. Think of the late meatloaf. They were wrong about that bad out of hell thing. Completely wrong. But they're like, no, no. And then finally it comes out and runs away with everybody. So you got to have that energy where you want to keep doing the music no matter what. I don't know how you get a happy harmony. But, you know, (laughs) in the end, the audience decides. When I worked at a theater called the IO Theater, it did not quite survive COVID or other uh, (laughs) issues. You can read about them online. Oh, you can probably get about your 60 to 70 people in a kind of a cabaret style area. But because of it was an old building, kind of in a basement. And when you were on stage, the audience is in front of you around cabaret tables. There's a long bar. People are sitting at the bar on stools. But there's other performers in a night. And you may have three to eight performers on an improv team. And they might be three acts a night. So you could have 20 performers over the course of the night. And where do they sit? Well, on a Friday or Saturday night, if the place is sold out, They would always sit at this corner of the bar where they could get drinks and kind of hang out and be there. Well, when you were on stage, you could hear where the laughs were coming from. And did I say something that made the general audience laugh or just made the corner of the bar laugh? And those were your peers. It's nice making the audience laugh, but it feels great making your fellow improvisers laugh. In fact, there's a kind of a a ghoulish pride to saying something that the audience does not get, but all of your peers really enjoyed, where the only laugh is coming uh, from that back corner. Now, you probably wouldn't have a long career if you never entertained the audience, but to, in one moment, be able to get judgment back coming from two different sources, both the general public and critics. Yeah, what do you think about that, Babette? It's it's supposed to be that the critic in Hume's time, at least, was thought to set the standard of taste. But that was at a time where economic forces meant that the average person didn't get to experience a lot of art, didn't get to go to the opera. And when things opened up and it seemed that those things most lauded by critics did not capture the popular imagination. So now we have this image of the snooty critic on the one hand versus the things that are entertaining to the masses. Does that affect Hume's conclusion about the role of the judge in actually determining what, at least at this point in time, should be considered superior art? Oh, that's a hard, hard question. Because after all, he was also doing a lot of what I was impressed to see that you do, which is also to beautifully promote sponsors. And, you know, we all hear these things. And so you, it is actually an art of that. How do you include support for those who support you? How do you do that? And that's actually what that example from Cervantes is. He's not actually thinking that Cervantes is yay cool and the best thing since sliced bread. That was the newest thing from Millar that was in the pipeline. So it was a plug. And it was a plug in order to get people to not only read this little collection pamphlet that Millar was publishing for you, but something that was bound to be a bestseller because it had already been a bestseller. And they had this new translation of the Don Quixote. So this was that. Hume is brilliant. So he does two things with one, just as you guys do. So I find that ability to do something while you also, what do we call it, walking in and then chewing gum at the same time, where we can do the one and also not forget the other. And that's also that beautiful example of paying attention to who's laughing or where the laughter is coming from. But you're not assuming that some of your colleagues might also have irony in their laughter. (laughs) You know, that's also very true. If something falls flat, you may get a laugh. Sorry, glad that wasn't me. Kind of a laugh that is certainly available to them. 
Yes. <laughs> well, I wonder with humor in particular, if I've heard that comedians are the least likely to actually laugh, that I think that might have been even in Mrs. Maisel that you mentioned at some point, that the people that they have a more refined sense of humor. And so it's not that they let these rip roaring belly laughs when they hear, you no, know, it's more the funniness of life. And so it's sort of post humor. And so a lot of what we do maybe in an improv setting can be, well, I didn't actually find that funny, but it was clever. You know, there were ideas there. I definitely, in my own experimental writing, uh, you know, was initially influenced by Dave Barry, you know, that he would like make a left turn. Ooh, ooh, here's, but he then began to seem very repetitive. Like, no, I want like some of these avant garde novelists where they turn and it's not even humor anymore. It is your stacking. It's conceptual art. It's not. You start to be able to see the strings. Uh, so it might be that the critics actually are dulled, that they don't have the best sense of what is beautiful or what is humorous because they are too into their own heads or something. Well, I mean, I like to think that a critic, just as you can have a good artist or a bad artist, you can have a good critic or a bad critic. And I like to think that a decent critic would be aware of that. I know people, Roger Ebert was the you know film critic here in Chicago and internationally, at least. I thought he did a fine job of saying, this is a wonderful movie. If you want an action movie, it's not really my taste, but as far as this genre goes, it's executed well. And I would like to think a critic would be aware of the fact of their own tastes and their own senses that have been dulled or senses that have been piqued by whatever they're looking at. I hope. I mean, it sounds like this critic of Humes was just an SOB, just a jerk. I mean, just like, I don't even care what his opinion is if he's just a terrible person, you know? He's just a money man as opposed to the elite among the artists that won't let you in their cool club. I mean, do we know about this critic's biography? You know, this judge of Humes? Do we know about how they were regarded in other parts of their life? Your big competition is his descendant, Nigel Warburton, is the physical, literal, the English are great at this tracing genealogy straight all the way down. They also have the same last name. So that is a kind of philosophy by its, you know, so this is a yeah. partially examined life, I think, very, very interesting already parallel or challenge. But he was just, a, in this particular case, a bishop. And it's just bad business for the Church of Scotland. And like the Church of England, the Church of Scotland is a particular, you know, branch of Protestants. And they can't have people thinking that there's no afterlife, for example. They can't have people thinking that there's no soul or very skeptical questions about God. Yeah. That's very bad for business if you're in the church. Yeah. Their judgment is already a form of some kind of propaganda. Well, it's an ideological judgment as opposed to an aesthetic judgment, that it wasn't just, I hate the way you wrote these. No, it's these are dangerous ideas. So I like the way Bill put it, that we consider things, we judge things according to their genre. This is a certain kind of thing. And so if you're familiar with that genre, then you can say, is this a good action movie? Is this a bad action movie? So if, if you're doing something that is a, a nihilistic post art, a flight from beauty sort of work, then one can judge it on those grounds and still be able to say, you know, I wish you didn't love ugliness so much, but as purposefully ugly hating the world art goes, this is very well executed, that you could still be a competent judge even if you don't like it. I would hope that that would be true, but in reality, I don't think that, I think a sympathy, a kind of empathy to use the most popular word these days, is necessary. You're going to feel with your artist. And when you're working any kind of room, whether you're teaching, I think, but I, I don't work in improv, but all of us, when we stand in front of people, we're being judged every step we take. So you can feel the sympathy or lack of it. And that changes over time, right? So the end of class, it's not as good at that particular point because they're tired and they're already out the door. So that's the other sense of it. Thinking about this critic of Humes that has been, we've kicked around a little bit. It reminds me that some people, when they look at art, they're looking for affirmation. I have known people that if you look at the art on their walls, it's an eagle with a flag. Is it well executed? No, but it has a message, you know, or, or they're very much into motorcycle. Is the eagle burning the flag? No, the eagle is happy. It's just it's some it's these very uber patriotic, almost jingoistic images. Are they art? Are they propaganda? I don't even know what they are, but what they certainly are is affirmation of the viewers. It's one thing to say, well, this critic of Humes was nasty or mean or spirited or aware of what they were doing, but it's also possible that they were not aware. It's bad for business, as you said. You know, were they aware it's bad for business or did they simply see art as an affirmation of what we believe and what society's norms and tastes already are? And that if it doesn't 
a firm, well, then it's weird or broken. And they may not consciously realize that it's eroding the standards that they hold dear, but they see that erosion and they feel that erosion, even if they can't put a label on it. Does that make sense? Is it still possible that people who see art as an affirmation of their other beliefs is still art or is it just garbage and they're deluded? I think we might have a way of of wrapping this up by talking about the play that all three of us fictionally just saw last night that it was the musical. It was the final work of Jim Steinman, who many know as the man who wrote Meatloaf's retrograde rock and roll. I thought it was pretty good. Are you starting a scene by just explaining? I'm starting a scene. Out of character? Just explaining <laughs> no, what, I'm what in it's character going to be now. about. Now you're in character, but before. I'm just very meta as when I'm in character. I like to talk about my life as it is, uh, as if it's a performance. A disembodied narrator describing, setting the scene like <laughs> the beginning of a, the, the program of a play. Yeah, thanks for bringing me to that show, y'all. Thanks for bringing me to that concert. Yeah. I mean, would you have paid for it? Did you like it enough that the $65 would have, you would have actually paid for that out of your pocket instead of my having to bring both of you? Oh, it was great hanging out with you guys. I enjoyed, you know, going out with y'all. And uh, that doesn't sound like a positive endorsement. Babette, did, did you enjoy, did you enjoy the musical? I mean, this was really important to me that you guys got something out of it. I got something out of it. I also thought you fit well into the question of the, of the pop culture, but you did leave out David Hume's attention to futures. He's an investment guy, after all. I kept emphasizing that he's a Scotsman, so he really cares about money and the bottom line. And so for him, the art has to appreciate in the future. And that's really what the judge has got to be able to call. And one of the things we're bad at is doing that. Should we get some beers or something? Or um... Beers, beers would be great. I thought it was weird that Jim Steinman would choose to write on the last days of David Hume. That is just an unexpected topic for him to cover in his last musical before his death. Did Jim do that? Yes. I mean, that, you, you saw it last night. That was, I mean, having the lead be an aged Molly Ringwald playing cross-gender as David Hume, I thought was a, an interesting choice, but she had a, a much better voice for that than I anticipated. It's the camera that never happened. It's very good. You guys see any good movies lately or... Um... You see, they got new, the new Jackass movie came out. And if you guys saw that. Uh, so it seems like you're, you're just trying to. St- what? I enjoyed the show. I enjoyed, I enjoyed the Jim Steinman Hume thing, whatever. I don't know. That, that was great. It was great. It was great. Okay. It was great. It didn't speak to you though. I would think that given Babette's background, that it might have spoken to her more directly because I mean, as a scholar, do you feel like that you could do justice in a musical to that story really? And the fact that they had to stop and sing. It was a lot of singing. I mean, there are, there are 38 distinct songs in that uh, two and a half hour production. A lot more swearing than I thought. But yeah, well, Bill, Bill, what do you think? I was expecting more sex and drugs and rock and roll. Can I be perfectly honest? Yes. And Mr. Steinman. And Meatloaf? No Meatloaf? Well, Meatloaf was supposed to be in it, but he was recast. He was uh, played the antagonist, the critic, and recasting it with a... Uh, See, I I think at first it was Ben Stein, but then he's dead as well. Del Close is dead. Who's the actor that actually, I think, no, John Ritter dead. Why would Jim Steinman go away from what works? Why would he stop writing about rock and roll and write about a 250-year-old dead philosopher? I mean, he's kind of tacking away from what got him there, yeah? I thought that the flashbacks to when Hume was 13 and discovering his burgeoning sexuality and playing a lot of pool and smoking, I thought that had some of the classic meatloaf feel to it, but you thought there wasn't enough of that, that it was all mostly Molly Ringwald in the the aged, uh, in the fat suit, in the aged makeup, in the beard. No, actually, he didn't have a beard. That it was just a lot of pantaloons and, and stockings. It was a lot of that for... The wigs. The wigs is what wigs I... And knee yeah. breeches and stockings and pleated shirts for a rock and roll show. You had to have oysters, many oysters, as yeah. many as you could eat. That's not rock and roll. <laughs> Yo, I don't, I just. <laughs> Didn't you feel like that song, My First Wig, where he's, you know, gets his first powdered wig and it's just, it's so uplifting. I know it's not as hard edged as this kind of stuff that you listen to, Bill. My first powdered wig. That's rock and roll. Going to the haberdasher to get one's first powdered wig you just got to set aside it's escapist it's you know into a historical past the period pieces 
are big now. You've seen that uh, the one with all Hamilton the, having sex into a pillow that that one on Netflix. Anyway, no, there's no, there's all these period pieces. That was the unfortunate bastards. <laughs> yes, that's true. Yes. You just put these little tiny chicks in the inside the, the mattress and they could have moved around. It's like magic fingers. Baby chickens in a mattress? Yes. The, that was, I think, a great practical effect. That was unfortunately a thing. And then you just had the down when you were done, kind of, because you couldn't take them out. What about their corpses? I'm assuming they died. Yes, yes, but they're small. So the beauty of a chick is that it really only has the substance of the egg from which it comes. There's nothing more. It's just that. And so you don't feed them. You just put them all in there. They go peep, peep, peep. And, and most of them die anyway, terrible deaths. So this is just That's horrific. Way. That's hor- I mean, you're trying to sleep hearing the final rattles of. They're not sleeping. This is, this is an erotic affair. You want oh, sex. I, yeah. And the fact sex. that they, <laughs> yeah, you want them sex and they spent a full half hour of the musical on this baby chick thing. I'm surprised it wasn't clear to you what you were looking at. <laughs> I, I couldn't believe it. I just couldn't believe what I would, that would, that, that didn't make any sense that this was some erotic affair, having a, a mattress stitched full of baby chicks, clearly for just for your erotic. I mean, well, and the fact that he objected to that and that, you know, was what gave him the theory of moral sentiments. It, it seemed just A to B. It's just basic psychological motivation. I'm, I'm not sure what problem you had with it. It's just, it's Jim Steinman's keen insight on the human psyche and how men are inspired to uh, greatness through gross encounters with baby chicks. This is also true. <laughs> I guess that is kind of rock and roll. That is kind of kind of rock and roll to have a bed full of chickens just to have sex on. That's they have to be chicks. Chickens are messy. Chickens are no good. Fair enough. Yeah. <laughs> Fair enough. Yeah, you recall he tried that as an adult with the old Molly Ringwald one where he tried with the adult chicken and it did not work out. And that was ultimately what led to his death. I think that was taking a little too much liberty with the history, but I'm not as familiar with the history. Uh, that was pretty rock and roll. I'll begrudgingly admit that that counts as a rock and roll lifestyle. All right, let's be done with that scene. <laughs> that is, that Yay. took some turns. Very fun, very fun. Diamond died a year ago, so that's all great. But <laughs> That didn't really happen, I hope. Tell me that didn't happen. The experience of the chicks in the stitched into the down yeah. mattress. Yes, yes, it did. That was historical fiction baby we just did historical fiction in improv which also includes a tiny tiny hint of truth because it's always yes. good to have a little touch a piquancy a spice of truth well well that's what yeah I, historical fiction has to have a lot of actual historical facts in it or else it's just fantasy right it's just fantasy. <laughs> one of the names mark mentioned del close is kind of the spiritual voice of the community i'm a part of and truth in comedy this whole notion that there is nothing funnier than the truth, and we can't think of any scenario that it is any way more fascinating or interesting than what is in the newspaper. What was in the newspaper when they made newspapers? We can share our truth on stage, and that we can be truthful people, and going back to this whole notion of artists and, and how they express themselves and whatnot, and are they being sincere, and that we can actually have better comedy and more ridiculous, fun, ridiculous things if we're true, and if we're people, and behave like people. So, yes, I would say more than just a smattering of truth. I would say a lot of truth. Well, damn. Was that your, <laughs> was that your lesson? Kind of. It was a piece of the lesson. I've already kind of said the lesson a little bit, but that's fine. Say it in more detail, because I'm not sure what you were actually trying to get us to do. Well, I just wanted to have interesting scenes where we interact with one another, just, just to demonstrate this whole idea that this thing is alive. We don't have a list of things. And I know sometimes, Mark, you typically might come in with a loaded suitcase sometimes of things, or, or you like scenes that kind of go at the philosophy kind of head on. But even you will admit that you don't know what I'm going to say. You don't know if I'm going to like or not like the concert, right? And you then have to acknowledge that I didn't like it very much, right? Yes. yes. <laughs> and, and I like that, though, you know, fortuitously, because one of the things I think that with Hume's account of the judge is that it's not just that there's the elite sages that are the judges. It's that we all engage in these processes. Even a judge competent to judge one genre may not have the expertise to taste the key in the cask or whatever. It's not just that someone is a judge across the board and that, you know, it's, of course, conversations is how we, by pointing out that there was actually truth in that bit of artwork that you overlooked, I was making you a better judge. That's how we achieve accord in our in our opinions by pointing out features that the other 
person didn't see that still requires an assumption of some commonality that if you would only see that thing, you would like it as much as I do or something like that. Babette, anything to add about that account of... Hume is very complicated. He, sure. he mysteriously doesn't actually give us his little standard, which is unfair of him. Uh, <laughs> but Kant, from what you've been saying, sounds like something I'd be looking forward to hearing when you finally get up to Kant, if you do, because he, he would fit in quite well with this notion. We did actually read that part of Kant's third critique on yes. partial exam in life, but it's so like, okay, what is his model of the mind and how does taste, you know, experiencing the joy of something with the free play of imagination. So it's all just like setting up this weird schematic. It's very hard to relate it to actual experiences of art. That was why reading Roger Scruton recently was great because he seemed mostly on board with Kant, but was actually talking about real experiences that we have now in enjoying art and talking to each other about it. Whereas Kant is so abstract. Are there some lectures or something that would be helpful? On Kant, it's always important to read him. I think that you can discover some parts of where he's going. He doesn't give you 50 cents in a box top, and very few philosophers do, whereas Roger Scruton, who was a great guy, does. And he also gives you the argument to make you have to follow what Kant is saying without necessarily explicating the claim that Kant is making, which is that when you're saying this is beautiful, your statement is a judgment for. So you're not saying, I find this beautiful. You're making a statement about it. And then, of course, the philosophers to come in and say how you can be doing that to begin with. Normally, at this point, wrapping up, we would sort of have a judgment come forward as to whether the philosophy or the improv lesson, I'm just going to put forward right now that I think this time they were one and the same, that there is no distinguishing, but maybe one or both of you disagrees. I support the improv. I think that ah. both of you as improv were extraordinary. And as well, I say, go. I'm going to hope that I've put a little bit of a bee in your ear to maybe bring on some actual visual images because your reactions to one another are invaluable. That is wonderful Thanks. for you to say. I guess I want the option in the future to disfigure my face and yeah. not have it affect the performance. So I don't know. Uh, there might be technical challenges, but that's definitely something we can discuss. Thank you so much for your time. Yes, improv improv wins, Bill. You Hooray. You got Hooray. it. Thank you very much for this invitation and thank you for the experience and the delight of listening to you. Wonderful, you. wonderful meeting you and, and chatting with you and amazingly in-depth knowledge and a joy at sharing that knowledge that came across to me that you enjoy the stuff. Yeah, I love it. I enjoyed learning from both of you today. And I enjoyed learning from both of you. And scene. All right. Hey, I hope you enjoyed hearing from Babette as much as we did. And I want to thank Babette so much for participating. And I'm hoping that philosophy professors will not shy away from this format, which is a pretty weird one for them. I want you to make sure you're subscribed directly to the Philosophy vs. Improv podcast, even if you're listening to this episode right now through the Partially Examined Life feed, because many of the episodes for this podcast are not being put in that feed. So go to philosophyimprov.com. You'll find links to the various places where you can subscribe to this, or just look up Philosophy vs. Improv on Apple or wherever else. Now, we continued talking to Babette. We got her insight on Suzanne Langer that we just covered on Partially Examined Life. Talked about some other stuff. That is in the supporter-only audio, which, again, you can get by going to patreon.com slash philosophyimprov or by signing up to the Mark Lintertainment channel through Apple Podcasts, which just means if you're already subscribed to the Philosophy Improv podcast, you just hit the subscribe button in your Apple Podcast app there, and it will sign you up. That will get you ad-free episodes and bonus content for all three of my non-PEL podcasts. And as a sweetener to support this show, if the prospect of a season two is not enough to get you to sign up, I'm going to be reading segments of my new book, Philosophy for Teens, Core Concepts and Life's Biggest Questions Examined. That is a book that is coming out. Actually, the Kindle version is already for sale now. The paper version will be on sale June 7th through Amazon or wherever you get your books. There is no audio version of that, and I actually don't own the rights to make my own audio version, but I can read some portions of it in places that are not publicly posted. So through one of those methods to sign up for a subscription to this podcast, Philosophy versus Improv, you will find this week I'm going to post my first little segment from that book that you'll get to hear in an exclusive audio format. 
I'll be recording at least two of those within the next couple of weeks to make it worth your effort to check out the subscriber content for this podcast. And the more people that sign up over there, the more segments of that I'm going to record. Again, that's patreon.com slash philosophy improv. Thanks so much for listening. Thanks so much for supporting in whatever way my podcasting efforts over the years. Without you, I would not have been hired to write this book. I would not have the time available to try a format like what you've just heard. And I would be spending much more time on my day job, which would make me very sad. So you are loved. You are appreciated. So long. Bankrupt. 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 Bankrupt.